Okay, welcome back everybody. We've just still have a few late stragglers coming back from the photo sessions, but this room will fill up pretty quick. Um, I'm not going to mess about with any announcements or anything straight away. I'm going to get up our final... Oh, firstly, when asking questions, hands nice and high, but the person's attention you're trying to get is not um, the people on stage. Try and get Brenda's attention, so wave at Brenda. And when you have a microphone and you're asking a question, make sure it's nice and close so everybody can hear you. Don't hold it down here so nobody can hear you. Um, we want the questions nice and loud. And that's the only announcement I've been given. So ladies and gentlemen, excited, please welcome to the stage Mr. Michael Shanks and Lexa Doig. Oh! Hello. Oh, it's working. Hello. Hey. Hello. Oh. oh my gosh, this thing is so cool. Sorry, I haven't seen this. This is like the coolest thing ever. Oh I god, like I gotta I go translate go, like, stuff now. Things and just like, hi. It's like I'm in Egypt. There she was, just a walking down the street. Singing. Do a diddy diddy dum diddy do. Is that the thing? Any? Look at the fabulous cake I baked. This thing is so cool. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Hey, didn't they just let a whole bunch of people into like some 4,000-year-old tomb in Egypt or something like that? Oh, yeah, no, and the people wanted to drink like the tomb juice, right? Like there was like this bizarre red liquid in, in, a, in a sarcophagus and people no, literally wanted to No, that's the pitch drink. for my next show. That's dinner, honey. Oh. I think Steve Basic was drinking that backstage, actually. <laughs> he had a lovely jar full of something unidentifiable and red. Hi! Hi! How's, how's the convention been? <laughs> Who's hung over? <laughs> Notice that was like, woo. I'm, just so you know, I'm not being rude. I'm trying to take a video of this for my children because they don't believe people actually like us. We're not done yet. They're not sure either, so. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm getting it. Hang on. Okay, so wait a sec. Wait a sec, honey. Everybody say hi to our kids. Okay, so see, people do like your mom and dad. <laughs> say bye, kids. Bye, kids. Bye. <laughs> Daddy? You're grounded. Okay, there we go. I we just don't like them very much. This is the funny part, is what they're going to say in return. I'm sending that to Mia. Okay, hi. So here it is. So here Do we are. I assume there's some form of questioning going on here. Yes, like their let's, life choices for being engage. in this room with us. Oh, my God. <laughs> this is actually a really great setup. I, I love told, this. Like, it's dope, man. Like, this thing is so cool. Oh, my God. There's people in there. Look at this. Did you guys know this? You probably did, and I'm just blind. There's like, there's like peep, like a guy, like a, but he's dark and he's in the shadows. Do you see this? You married it. We've got like 45 minutes to like answer people's questions and you want to point to the wallpaper in the background. so cool. Okay, never mind. Hi! <laughs> oh, one! I'm assuming that's because you have a question. I do. Yes. Um, this question's for Michael, I'm sorry. But when you got a new script, did you just assume you were going to die in that episode? <laughs> or were you hoping you'd survive? Anytime I get a script, I assume I'm going to die. So, yes. Um, no, it wasn't actually until, I think I've told this story before, but it wasn't until Fire and Water where Brad Wright was sitting on a plane with me and we were on our way to a, something to promote the show. And he passes me a teaser for a script that he's sort of writing and or having a hand in, um, in um, overdrafting. And, and um, the teaser is Daniel's funeral. <laughs> and then I read it and I'm like, what the hell? And he goes, now give it back. So I give it back to him and he's like, have a good flight. And he wouldn't, I sort of was like going, what, what's, what's that all about? What? He, goes, he goes, that's all I'm going to tell you. 
So basically, like, for the next week and a half, I was tormented until the script started coming out slowly that I thought my character was dying in the first season of the show in Fire and Water. So um, ever since then, every day alive has been a blessing, so. Two. Oh, two. You're numbered. I know, this is, it's really weird. Hi. Hi. Um, so this has been echoed throughout the convention, but um, the show started 21 years ago. Uh, the conventions have been going on for a while. Um, what do you guys think of like the fans being still invested for 21 years? I, I, we we're just talking about this. We did a, an interview with. Um, I think it's amazing. With with Gate World and Stargate Command, and and um, I think that um, what's been it's been exciting to sort of see the the length of, of time that the, the fans have been invested, especially that the show is not in a lot of places not airing anymore or it's only on Hulu or something like that, that there's a new generation of fans as well as the fans that have continued to be interested in our lives and you know the, the longevity of the franchise and where it's going and stuff like that. It's been incredible, so it's been a, a, a gift to... Uh, to have you guys be part and invested in, in the show and for, for people who, you know, still scares the hell out of me when grown men are coming up or grown women are coming up and saying, oh, I, I've been watching it since I was a child or, <laughs> you know, saying I just, just started watching the show last week. I mean, that's equally uh, um, fantastic to have people as invested then or now as they were then or, or as other people were then and to have uh, so many years passed, it's been fantastic and I'm curious as to see where the franchise is going to go from here. What he said. <laughs> what he said. Number one in the blue. Oh, oh, oh so I was looking for three. Yeah, I think it just goes one and two. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, again, greetings from the Tokra High Council. <laughs> Cree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, this is this question is for Alexa. Um, you, you played a, a physician, and did you study anything medical, or did you just walk on and start saying the lines? Well, here's the thing. Um, <laughs> I've played a few doctors. My mom's actually a nurse, so I grew up around doctors and nurses, so like medical jargon is something that I'm A, very comfortable with, and B, kind of interested in myself. I used to want to be a neurosurgeon until I realized it's like 16 extra years of postgraduate study, and I just went, no, I'm going to be an actor and pretend to be somebody that smart. Way easier, and you arguably get paid more. So um, I'm totally comfortable with like, that kind of stuff. But the thing is, is it's actually also not difficult to, to find what it is that you're talking about. So you know what you're talking about. I really sound very stupid right now, don't I? <laughs> awesome. She only plays a doctor on TV? I only play a smart person. Yeah. Other people have to make me sound smart. Hope that answered your question. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So, uh, How's your study on Ascension going? <laughs> I missed it. Can you say, repeat it? I, I missed it. How's, how's your it? study on Ascension, how's that going? My study on Ascension? Chicago? No, oh, seriously. Oh, you're, you're refraining that quest, that, that in, in, inimitable question? It's going well. I hope she's doing well, too. <laughs> We're working on. Was that me, or was that you? Were you? You're, you are you part of you both? Because I could answer for both of us. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Um, <laughs> actually, yeah, you can, because we both worked on uh, Unspeakable. The other thing I can't talk about. Why can't you talk, why can't you talk about Unspeakable? Because it's... Uh, you, unspeakable, you're not I can. The other thing that I just... That you, I know, why can't you talk about that? Spoiler alert, dum-dum? No, can't. <laughs> Well, you, you don't have to give away the plot. Well, you can I know, say what but I know I can't. On. I can't say I've been working on that at all. You can't say you've been working on it at all. Oh, shit, sorry. <laughs> I, just, I, <laughs> I was trying to cover the mic because I thought you were going to say the name of the show. <laughs> sorry, honey. <laughs> Hashtag me too. I know. I thought you were gonna say the name of the show. I wasn't gonna say the name of the show. All I'm right, asking so why anyway. you can't. You wanna slap me one more time or? No, I meant to cover the mic. You just moved. If you hadn't moved. Well, when somebody does this really fast, I usually move. <laughs> to 
you for flinching. Is somebody recording this? Because they need yes, to like, watch this Yes, it's live streaming Ooh. across the world. Oops. Um, okay, so yeah, there's this really important... Anyway, when the lawyers see series. that, they'll know. Uh, there's this really... Which Michael plays the lead of. I'm only in a couple of episodes called Unspeakable that Rob Cooper wrote. Yay for Rob Cooper. Um, that is uh, about the tainted blood crisis um, of the 80s which is a really interesting thing. Do you want to talk a little bit more about it? Yeah, Unspeakable is, is uh, obviously it's a um, based in real life uh, uh, period piece that lasts over, runs over the course of about 30 years from um, the Tainted Blood scandal in 19, starting in about 1981, 1982 to the present uh, involving um, characters that are based on uh, some real people and some characters who are real pe people um, that uh, were actually part of you play a real person, uh, and my character is a bit of a hybrid of a couple of real people. Uh, that um, uh, Rob Cooper um, uh, was a hemophiliac, and um, well, is a well, no, he was he was well, yes, he was cured of the Hep C, but he was a, he's a hemophiliac who contracted hep hepatitis C from. Um, I, am I telling the story, or are you? You just take, you take a really long time. I'm sorry, honey. Maybe you'd like to slap me again and we could um, <laughs> like go faster. I feel um, anyway, from um, cryo that he was taking for, uh, uh, for the clotting factor for his hemophilia and he contracted hepatitis C. And it's about people over that time period, uh, specifically in Canada, that um, endured uh, the cover-up and the, um, the ongoing effort to get some sort of um, closure of it that's still kind of ongoing and it's uh, airing on C CBC in Canada and Sundance Channel in the US and I'm not sure where it'll air internationally but I'm sure it'll get out there somewhere. It was an eight episode miniseries that Rob wrote and of course it's very near and dear to his heart um, because it's a uh, part of his life um, and it was uh, really a lot of um, uh, pride to be part of that um, and uh, hopefully it's going to turn out as well as it was written so um, I'm very yeah, proud of it. If you do get a chance to see it I highly recommend it. Um, it's so well written and so uh, wonderfully done. And there's a lot of people that were on Stargate that were in it, like Polly's in it, yeah, Peter Fleming's in it, McGillian's Peter in Fleming's it. Peter Fleming's in um, it. Um, oh God, so many people. I know. There's actually it had like a cast of about four million actors, so there were a lot of people in it. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Yes. Welcome. Um, my question's for Michael, just a small question. For all the things that Daniel has had to squint and try to decipher and translate for everybody across the entire seasons, um, did the props people ever put anything in the text of what you were reading or translating on the walls or whatever for you to find and did that ever crack you up or did you ever just interpose something that you wanted to say instead of what you were supposed to be translating? Well, I always tried to slip in something that I alone put in into the exposition, but they usually caught it and said no. <laughs> or I tried to, you know, fast talk a gag or something like that. Actually, our props people were really good, not with so much with, with, with stuff I was translating, but um, inside the briefing room itself and inside props sometimes, if, they had, if I had to read a story or was translating something, and they'd write the English part of it. Like if I was reading, say, like Ernest Littlefield's book or something like that. If you actually read the script, it's the, the props person has to write out some long story because we're going to see words on the page. We're going to, you know, we're not going to see the detail. And eventually, once they run out of things that they're just sort of like, you know, train of thought kind of writing, they start writing just what's ever going on in the props guy's head. And they eventually end up writing stuff like, and if you're still reading this at this point, then you obviously have nothing better to do. Why don't you get back to work and do something important? <laughs> Inevitably. Um, so they used to, we used to, they, sometimes if you actually read some of the long things that they wrote, some of the shit that they put in was hilarious. So, um, but in the translatable stuff, no, I never saw, like there was never any, you know, uh, which I would have done. That's my sense of humor, like a pharaoh sitting on a toilet or something like that. In, F the fine print, but no, there was nothing. Um, if if they did, it was way over my head anyway. So, yes. Oh, this is for Mr. Shanks. Uh, uh, season seven, episode one, Fallen. Uh, uh, sir, I have a question about you lying naked on the ground. Um, I knew I recognized that voice. <laughs>
there was a point in the discussion, I believe, with the director of that, that uh, um, uh, the naked part, um, you were complaining about it being cold, but uh, sir, I don't remember it actually being that cold. Um, uh, it felt to me like, like there was a, oh, here's a doctor, he can describe uh, what happens when it's cold to a human man. Uh, but it wasn't really that cold, Mr. Shank, so I'm just... Go make gonna... me a frittata. He's still talking. <laughs> okay, I, I actually have another question. This would be for, uh, uh, for Alexa Doig. Um, uh, 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 Alexa, you did a, uh, a movie that your husband appeared in as a cameo. Yes, uh, yes. A real murderer's thing. Yes. Um, now, uh, your husband seemed <laughs> agitated as he came out and shook his fist at some children who happened to be your children and mine And yeah, uh, at that time. Uh, uh, we talking. called him the grizzled hillbilly at that point because he seemed to Hadn't have a shaved full face in four of months? hair. That yes. guy, yeah. yeah. Um, now, can we speak about his genitalia in that scene, please? Uh, <laughs> I believe in that scene, it was a little warmer and his genitalia was covered. I, I don't remember that part. Considering you were directing part. it, you really should. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for answering that for me. Am thank I that you. short? <laughs> this was like a whole thing that was happening here that yeah. I was just... Uh, first happened? of all, to answer your question, Mr. Whoever your name is, the funny thing was, in the script, Daniel wasn't naked <laughs> when he descended... He's still going. <laughs> Hang on a second. <laughs> oh, oh, next question. Uh, sir, uh, <laughs> what's your name? Valerie. Valerie. Everybody? Valerie? Well, welcome Valerie to the stage. There we go. Does anybody have any questions for Valerie? Yeah. All right. Oh, yes. Back there for Valerie. Or you can just, you know, yell really loud. Are you having any remorse about the auction last night? Valerie with the great mouth. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> No, uh, I, did, <laughs> I did have five seconds this morning and say, oh my God, I spent almost $7,000 last night, but it's all good. It's for charity, guys. Oh. Woo! Yeah. Woo! <laughs> oh my God. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, US. US! No. It, it was it was five thousand dollars U.S. for the script, so it's about sixty-five hundred Canadian. But I also did buy other things, so it made it about seven thousand dollars total. Um, it was a Wormpole extreme extreme script that was actually copy, and the autographs are copy on it. But we kind of went wild last night. Wow! <laughs> Drinking in conventions, folks. They don't mix. People I have, think they do. They don't. I have one question: Did any of this happen after midnight? No, really? Okay, because I'm of the firm, like, nobody should pull their wallet out after midnight, ever. Wow, so you were, like, sober. That's extraordinary. Congratulations. Wow. Even I don't do that. And I do some pretty spectacular shit. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, if you had seen Stargate before you joined the cast, like if you'd seen Michael in action, or if you could tell us a little anecdote about when you guys like first met on the set. Um, well, I we were married um, when I got cast on Stargate, so I had seen it, and um, had you? Yeah. Well, why don't you tell only the, because what, Claudia was on it. Why don't you tell the story about what what what, what you thought about me? Oh yeah. Before so we I met. was told I was told by one of the producers of Andromeda that he was going to be playing my love my love interest in the first season and the show that the episode of Andromeda that we met, which was called Starcrossed. And I was like, hmm, I don't know this guy. Early days of the Google. 
So I get on and I check it out and I look him up and I see all these pictures and I'm like, oh, he's totally like the granola munching, Birkenstock wearing, hippie, West Coast, tree hugging kind of a guy. So not that guy. I mean, like, likes trees, does not eat granola, never wears Birkenstocks. He's like an angry dude from the, from like the interior of BC. So it was like, just that's what I totally thought of you. And what did you think of me, dear? Why do you think I'm so angry? And divorce time. Do we have any lawyers in the house? <laughs> oh, excellent, look, lawyers, right. Rip me, 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 not him, me. I don't know, she saw the abuse earlier on. <laughs> it was incidental. It was accidental. Incidental contact. Yeah. <laughs> Over here. Yes. Every time you have to go in this sarcophagus, because you never get claustrophobia. I mean, I know you were only in for a while, but did anybody ever forget to open it and let you out <laughs> if you weren't behaving yourself? The only thing, uh, I think, the, the, the thing about the sarcophagus is they had um, lights in the interior of it, so you didn't really, it kind of was like getting into a tanning bed. It, the door is closed, and you just were sitting there in the light going, well, I hope they open soon. But it, you're, it wasn't like you were in a, you know, it wasn't like when I was a kid and they would stick me in that dark box in the basement. <laughs> it wasn't anything like that. Oh. <laughs> he's a, I just want you all to know he's actually producing tears. Is that because you're holding your breath, or are you actually... Yes. Okay. <laughs> and I'm thinking about Martin making me naked in the field again. Martin clearly did not have your enthusiastic and consent. And Martin, that whole alien probe I in the butt left. thing, that never panned out either, so... He's not he, here he anymore. Leave? You're talking... He literally left. He oh literally God, got he bored and left. Oh. He fully came in and trolled and then buggered off? That's how he directs, too. Yeah. It totally is. The sarcophagus, could you get out of it? No. Real, like, there was no like escape hatch if you suddenly got claustrophobic and freaked out. Well, you I just had to like, yell I and scream. I think I would have warned them they might have, you know, I think they, they opened it pretty fast after they closed it, but I, I'm not claustrophobic, so. <laughs> That's not what you told me yesterday. It's because you were getting too close. <laughs> Next question. Oh, over yawn. Oh, I see there's a big He's yawn. <laughs> Sorry if I lose it. <laughs> oh, she, uh, reference to Hallmark. My, uh, sorry. That's okay. okay. How about we go over here for now? Yes, let's give, give some love. Let's give some love. Hi. So, well, thank you guys for being here. Um, my question is for Michael, but I would love to hear what Lexa thinks as well. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you were my favorite actor with Tilk, and I am an anthropologist, and I was very, very interested in listening to what you were saying, but you speak so fast, <laughs> and English is not my first language, so, once in Facebook, they were saying who speaks faster, McKay or Daniel. And with you, literally, literally, you were the only one that I had to um, stop the video with English translation. <laughs> and, and also uh, pause the video because also the translation were like... like uh, <laughs> so then I had to pause it. So my question is, the directors said something to you about speak slower, speak slower, 
And let's, uh, maybe you can share if he speaks as well fast at home. <laughs> he speaks in monosyllabic grunts at home. <laughs> like, if nobody has provided him the words to speak, it's usually... <laughs> Hockey stick, food, sleep. Like, that's kind of it. Wow. Or, wait a minute, we have two cats that he spoils rotten, and it's... Baby kitties. You think I'm kidding? I'm not kidding. He's a total sucker for the cats. You are, they love you. They're your cats, they love you. Huh? Um... Sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, the older directors? No, actually, uh, no. Um, the reason why, because you'll notice that Daniel at the beginning of this series doesn't speak as fast as he kind of does later on. What actually happened was, over the course of time, what happened in the first season was that they'd write these large passages for, for Daniel to speak, and I would try and enunciate them and get them through and have make sure that everybody understood and everything was clear. Because I sort of come from a theater background and clarity is, is key. And I noticed that during the course of, of the editing process, they'd either cut me speaking or they'd cut away from me all the time because I was taking too long or they'd, you know, I'd, I'd memorize a page long speech and they'd cut it by a third or cut it in half. And I was going, hang on a second, it took me like three days to memorize that shit, you just cut it all. And so what I do is in order to make sure it was gonna actually get in the show, I would start to speak it faster because they gave me these large passages to speak. And then because I would squeeze them all in, the passages started to get bigger over time. <laughs> And so I started to get faster speaking it to make sure I could squeeze it all in. And by the end, I was probably going warp speed and time traveled to some point in my parents' early history um, where I realized I was going probably a little bit too fast. But I want to say that David Hewlett speaks faster than I do, and you can't understand a goddamn word he says. <laughs> and I was standing right next to him, so I know, because I didn't even know it was my cue, because I couldn't hear the cue line. I was like... Jesus, he's done. <laughs> so I think that Hewlett's got an edge in the um, warp speed speaking front. Yes, over here. Hi, I'm going to ask uh, uh, the question on behalf of Todd. Uh, this is for Michael. Michael, you did a Hallmark um, movie with a military character. And uh, first of all, Todd just wanted to say uh, thank you very much for the portrayal that you did, and he wanted to know what it was like for you. Oh boy, I, that, that was a, a really nice movie to do, actually. That was, uh, uh, I was talking about um, uh, what started off as, the movie was originally called Welcome Home Warrior, um, and uh, they changed the title, as Hallmark sometimes does, to Christmas Homecoming, about a soldier who uh, comes home on leave after being wounded, and he's experienced some trauma, uh, in his um, in his recent deployment, and he ends up um, finding comfort with a widow whose husband has died in action as well. So it's a, very much a, a, a movie that was dedicated to the military, and um, um, it was great because it was uh, it wasn't I guess the way to say it, it wasn't typical Hallmark schmaltzy love story uh, kind of fair. It was you know it was a Christmas movie, and it wasn't wasn't just about will they or will they won't will they not get together kind of movie that Hallmark usually is. It's more about, you know, how are these two people going to find common ground and find comfort in each other's um, experience of loss. And so it was, um, it was actually a really nice movie to do. And it was, um, um, and I'm, I'm glad it resonated. It seemed to resonate with a, with a few people in the military community. And of course, um, we have tremendous respect for anybody that, that serves in, in Canada and the U.S. Uh, and all over the world in the armed forces to keep us free and safe. So, um, um, I'm glad that you enjoyed it, Todd, and um, um, that's all I have to say. It was, it was a good experience, so. Oh, I think I see a, a big one over there. I, I am a big one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a pleasure seeing you guys. I've really enjoyed all your work. Um, the question I have is, uh, primarily for Lexa, uh, going from Andromeda, where you were there from the beginning and you gelled as a crew and a team and a cast, how is it moving over to Stargate 
in the last couple of seasons to join this existing family and work with your husband more regularly? Uh, shockingly easy because I knew pretty like everybody that pretty much that I would be working with on Stargate I knew socially through Michael um, and so it was it was the, really easy and because Andromeda had wrapped some of our crew had ended up going over to SG1 to work anyway so when I'd go to work even behind the the camera there were people that I knew um, so it was it was really comfortable for me how did it how did you feel about it? About you coming to set? Yeah, about your okay. wife working with you. I believe you said something to Coop about that. <laughs> you told me. I Don't deny it. I said... <laughs> did, I say some, did I say something nice to Coop about it? No. Nope. Oh, shit. <laughs> I believe you marched into Coop's office and said, You hired my wife? I can't get away from this woman. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. I can Not picture bad, me bad. saying... Yeah. <laughs> but it was easy and we had fun. Michael and I actually, in all seriousness, work very well together. And I, yeah, I and enjoy that, working with and Michael. And we, we, the, the funny thing about us working together is that some of the few times we actually get to be alone without children interrupting us or trying to get our attention. We have, we have children who literally, since they were born, and still do this to this day, when we engage in a conversation, say, in, within their earshot... They don't even have to be. They can be somewhere else in our house. We've got they a pretty big house. feel the need to interrupt us, as if we're getting together to conspire against their lives. Like if we're just talking about, you know, anything, the news or something like that, and we're just talking like as at one adult to another, they will come into the kitchen and interrupt us because God help it that we have a conversation that's uninterrupted. Yeah, but the cats do that too. <laughs> Literally, these cats will walk in and start meowing and jump up on the counter and and like yell. Yell at us if yeah. we're just trying to have a conversation. Pay attention to me, me, me. It's like frickin' Ergo. Well played, Shanks. Well played. I still remember some of that stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry, what did you just say? You just say his name and he appears. <laughs> I have one question. I yes. have one question. Of all the Deloise that you worked with, and be very careful with how you answer. Which one was your favorite? All of them. Oh, that's way too easy. <laughs> no good. No good. <laughs> no, I've been, I've been very blessed. I've gotten to work with all of the Deloise family, except for your mom. Except for your mom. It's, it's true. You guys did, your parents did a very good job, by the way, I must say. It's true. <laughs> I think I, I've said this numerous times, and this is true, and I'm not just saying as David's here, as uh, I've said it privately, publicly, or whatever, that out of all the showbiz families that have um, uh, been run through the business, I've gotten to work with two of the best um, between um, the Bridges family and the Deloise family. They're just amazing, amazing people, and uh, I've been very lucky that way. So. Well, Jeff won't return my phone calls. Jeff Bridges won't return my phone calls, so I like the Deloise family better, yeah. <laughs> and over here. Oh, right. Are these some of the live stream questions? Yes, yeah, so we've got These some questions words. are coming from the interwebs. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got some great ones. So our first one is from Sonia Melenkoff, who's one of our biggest Stargate Command fans. And it's her birthday today, number oh, right. one. We're supposed uh, to say happy birthday. Yeah, can you guys say happy birthday, Sonia? Yeah, you want to sing? Happy birthday, Sonia. Are we all going to sing? Okay, oh, ready? Are you row, happy row, birthday. row your boat gently. Wrong song. Oh, you, you just said birthday. sing. I don't no, know. Happy, I... Birthday. happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sonia. Oh, was yes. it? Okay, good. Happy birthday to you. I can't sing, but yay! Awesome. So we've got one from Lauren Nichols from Michael. Did you know that Daniel would inspire people to pursue archaeology when you started or historical paths in life? 
I, I've heard that a lot, that a lot of people at different conventions have come up to me or, or even written letters and sort of said that you've insp uh, your character inspired me to, um, to study archaeology in school. And I'll say the same thing to them, um, to you, that I said to them, which is, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not as exciting as it looked on TV, is it? I mean, it's a fascinating study, and I'm glad that people that are really, you know, are, are saying thank you because they really enjoy it. And that's, I mean, if, uh, if you can do anything positive, inspire people to, do, to study something important, I think um, studying our past is, uh, is very important, as evidenced by the 4,000-year-old uh, tomb that they opened up for people, and I, I'm dying With to see it. The red liquid that people want to drink. Yeah. And probably die. Such a Stargate episode waiting to happen anyway. So the last one that we want to ask from uh, Twitter is from Talish, at C.A. Talish. What was Jackson's question during Window of Opportunity? In your, opin in your oh, opinion. Wait a minute. Didn't you just get asked this today? No. Oh. Sorry. That just happened. I missed to, it. The, the one that was punctuated so by... It's okay. I, I did it. Uh, I answered the question uh, earlier for... Uh, uh, interview that I was so doing, I just so. reset like window of opportunity I just ha have you do it again yeah no it's that's not your fault listen it's time loop yeah it's okay well, I, well it's okay people ask me that all the time what was Daniel really asking and I always say I'm not telling you you don't need to know everything is it time to reveal the truth I guess it might as well be time to reveal the truth which is there wasn't really any question that I was answering which is the absolute truth there was no question I was answering there was no subtext to it. There was no secret little, you know, I think when people read into it is whatever they want it to be. That's the answer. That's the truth. It's not as interesting as some people thought. It's actually just lazy acting, to be honest with you. You needed to fill in the blanks. I'm not just going saying. to tell you what I thought the question was. I'm just saying what the script said, what that Daniel was answering, was unspecific. So... I inserted something of my, my own, but that's what you but do I as an actor. But I think that's what everybody's asking. Well, I'm not answering that question, no. <laughs> yes, over Jan. Who is this Jan person you keep talking about? <laughs> you can't see him. He's my imaginary friend. Hi there. This one's... Oh. I recently got to watch... Louder! <laughs> And uh, I thoroughly was entertained by it, and I'm sorry it took so long for me to watch it. But my question was, how was it working with Kevin Sorbo on that set? Was it entertaining? Were there any fun stories that happened? Ke yeah, Kevin's a great, he's, he's, a, he's a lovely person to be sort of number one on the call sheet. I personally have this um, theory about sets, because for those of you that don't know, uh, any day on a set, there's, they, there's issued a call sheet and actors are, are given numbers according to their uh, place in the cast, just for scheduling purposes. And so generally the star of the show is number one and the numbers go accordingly. So Kevin is number one on the call sheet. And I have this sort of um, theory that number one on the call sheet sets the tone. Meaning, if you have like this really awful human being who's number one on the call sheet, or somebody who's selfish or somebody who's kind of, you know, self-absorbed or whatever, that kind of has a trickle-down effect. I think you can see it in a lot of different industries in terms of people at the top. Kevin is a very good captain of the ship, literally. As number one on the call sheet, he sets a really nice tone on set, so people were very, like, happy to be there, and it was light and it was funny and nothing didn't, you know, things didn't get really too heavy. Um, so that part of it was fine, and the rest of us all got along very well. Kevin was wrapped out every day by 6 o'clock because he had to be, so we were... The rest of us were working the whole time. So it was, you know, it was fun. We had our own sort of jokes. And the rest of the cast, like, I knew Gord Woolvet from the time I was, like, I've known Gordy for, like, 27 years or something like that. And, and I had just finished working with Lisa. And so, you know, we, we all kind of knew each other anyway. So the jokes were sort of fast and furious. One thing we did that was actually kind of fun is we, because we'd get sent our fan mail from... Um, from Tribune in LA, and they'd open it, which was really weird. We'd be like, why are you opening our stuff? And they're like, oh, we just want to make sure everything's okay. Periodically, we'd get these kind of nutty, like every once in a while, and then so it would be like when we'd get our, when we'd get our fan mail, we'd kind of bring, bring the best, we'd bring the highlights in to just kind of go, here's one. I remember there was one gentleman who asked Gord, it was kind of genius, he was in prison, 
which is, you know, one thing. Um, but he, uh, he said he was taking a course and needed the home address and phone number of a celebrity to pass his course <laughs> in jail. And we're like, what's the course? Stalking 101? Like, what is that? So like, it was funny things like that because the rest of it was all just really lovely stuff. But it was like, the, every periodically you'd get these like odd ones that were just like, what do you think? One, one guy wrote into Laura Bertram and asked her for like $500,000? Just randomly, where you're like, that's amazing. Uh, we, we put our favorite one on our fridge, actually. Oh, was that the... The, the one to... The, there was somebody who that wrote... That was to Lisa, yeah. Who wrote to Lisa Ryder asking oh, to borrow the Eureka Maru. Eureka Maru, which is a spaceship. He wanted to borrow it because he needed to fly to Hollywood headquarters to meet the president of Hollywood operations, Lee Majors. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, but didn't he... No, but was this the same guy who wanted Lisa to, like, drive him there? In the Eureka Mar, like it was a very, it was amazing. It was just like yeah, it was it was otherworldly in terms of its whatever dimension. <laughs> but it was kind he of like a script into, into itself. Oh yeah, like, there was absolutely. a whole storyline. It was amazing. So yeah, but most of the he time he didn't even call her by her character. He referred to her as her actor name and needed to fly to Hollywood headquarters to save the world for some particular reason. Yeah, but needed to talk to like the president of Hollywood headquarters, Lee, Lee Majors. Majors. Which I mean, hey, wouldn't you? Like, I'd vote for him. I'm just saying. And he is the president of Hollywood headquarters, anyway. Yeah, you guys aren't supposed to know that. Shh, Michael! I know. It's yeah. okay. Hi! Um, so, speaking as a pastor's kid who went way far away from that field, um, are your children following in your footsteps, or are they just running in the other direction? We try to frighten them as much as possible from fo our footsteps. Um, Although the eldest, Tatiana, just won a bunch of awards at the um, yeah, Madrid Film Festival in Amsterdam. And my, my daughter, who just turned 20 this year, when she was 18, she started making this, this her first sort of first full-length short film. I know that full-length short film sounds funny, but it's kind of true. She'd made like a little almost fun one before that she put on YouTube, which was actually kind of good when she was about um, 15. And then she made this one that her mother produced that she's um, won a bunch of awards and film festivals all over the world. So she wants to go into directing. She wants to pursue the field. And our, our other daughter, Mia, um, is a singer. And um, she kind of and wants songwriter. to act. Yeah, and songwriter. And she kind of wants to act. Um, and but so, she's not allowed to? Yeah. We're, we're preventing them from you know seeking to do it professionally. Uh, at this point. At this They're point. Yeah. Uh, we want them to study and, and actually, you know, do it for the reasons of loving to do it as opposed to doing it because mom and dad are on TV and that's kind of cool. Um, so or they want more Instagram followers. Yeah, or whatever it is. You know, I really like, I really want to meet the people on that Disney show, so I want to be an actor. Oh, okay. no, she's over Disney shows. I know, but I'm saying this is, these are the ongoing reasons. So, Stay with it. Um, we're, we're, we're not openly discouraging them so much as uh, we're, not, we're not openly encouraging them. We just want them to find their own way. So hopefully and, they'll make the right And decision. our youngest, although I do have to say this, our youngest in some respects, our son Sam, probably in a way would be the best at it. Because when he was younger, he's so committed, like in, in, in preschool, he was so committed to roles that he played in his head. Like, who was he? He was Steve from Blue's Clues. Yeah. Annie from Little Orphan Annie. Yeah. He was the great and powerful Oz, which is Oz from The Wizard of Oz. He was so committed, complete with costumes and everything, that he wouldn't respond to his own name. And when we dropped him off at preschool, it would be, the preschool teacher would be like, and who are we today? <laughs> um, so we jokingly referred to them as his alters because he was so committed, like it was, he was not Sam anymore, he was whoever this, this character was. But the best was when he, Michael won Dad of the Year when he introduced my son to this video game called Left 4 Dead, which is a first-person shooter. But you kill zombies, in fairness. But Sam would be dressed up as Steve from Blue's Clues with the little backpack on his back. And he comes up to me one day and he hands me an empty water bottle. And he's like, Mom, can you make me a Molotov? <laughs> so I literally am putting napkins in, in the plastic water bottles as my son, who has this like little plastic toy, you know, gun type thing, is running around the house going, fire in the hole! <laughs> Come on, Blue, let's get the zombies! <laughs> so he, he and 
Blue from Blue's Clues would go zombie hunting thanks to Michael. So aspiring writers out there, that's Get a dream it. crossover episode, by the way. And yes. <laughs> this is for Michael. I'm from Michigan, so I really enjoyed your portrayal of Gordie Howe and Mr. Hockey. So I wonder, were you a fan of Gordie Howe before you took the role, or did you get to meet him while you filmed it? Um, I, I, w w the, when I grew up, I was born in 1970, so by the time I was, you know, we had two television stations in the town that I grew up in, so there wasn't much, we got mostly one game a week from, from the NHL on Saturday nights on Hockey Night in Canada, and, um, Gordy wasn't back in the league till around 75, 70, yeah, around, around then when he came back with the Hartford Whalers. So I never saw anything of Gordy when he was at, at his peak, um, and certainly not anything in the WHA either. So it wasn't until he was back in the league when it was, I remember my dad telling me about this, the fact that we were watching a game one day and I didn't really understand what was going on, but he was pointing at this old guy that was skating around on the ice, and he sort of said, if you watch, nobody's touching him out of respect. And I watched it, and I'm like going, oh, yeah, nobody's really trying to hit this guy or whatever. And it wasn't, of course, until later that I realized it wasn't out of respect so much as out of fear <laughs> that they didn't want to get old elbows mad. Um, and, of course, anybody that, um, you know, as I grew up, the legend of Gordy sort of grew, you know, uh, in my mind. But, of course, you know, not having too many archival references to sort of watch him play um, is still prominent to this day. Because even doing the research to do the movie, I couldn't find a lot of footage of Gordy actually playing the game. Um, uh, it was fantastic to do the movie. Uh, it was a blessing. We, um, I did not meet Gordy until afterwards, uh, the following year, um, when I actually went to a um, convention in Toronto where, where I was there filming Saving Hope, and I brought. I knew we, I knew he was going to be there, and Paul Brown from Legends let me in because he was there with Rick, and um, I went and got the the jerseys from the movie signed by Gordy and then had a really long conversation with his son, Marty, uh, about the movie and about, you know, because they were listed as producers on the movie and they, they, did, they, they didn't come to set. Um, they were a little bit uh, preoccupied during that time. And of course, uh, Gordy at that particular point was, um, was not well. He was well into his dementia and, and um, that was actually his last signing that he ever, ever did. Um, but what I do remember is I'm standing there talking to to Marty about um, about the movie and little details that they liked and some that they didn't like and whatever and and some of the behind the scenes shenanigans and all of a sudden I get this you know something in the side of my face and I look over and Gordy's done signing he's come over and given me a little elbow chop right under my chin and he gives me a wink he hadn't said a word really the whole day and he kind of gives me a wink and he leaves out the back, and Marty has to go follow him. And so that was, I got an elbow from elbows, and that was uh, enough of a thumbs up for me for, for doing the part. So, um. Hi. Hello. Oh. Um, this question is for Alexa. Sorry, Michael, but I was a fan of Andromeda before Stargate. Um. <laughs> um. What was it like playing several different versions of the same character of uh, Rami on Andromeda? Um, it was fun. Like it was, it was interesting because that's what I had to do for my audition initially. Was basically there was one scene with three different versions of Andromeda talking to herself, and I had to do it three times, one as each sort of character, so to speak. And um, sorry, I think that might be my child calling me, and she's not. I'm turning that off. Sorry about that. Um, Mia was calling. I don't know if the house is burning down. Anyway, um, <laughs> and I just turned it off. <laughs> Mother of the year. <laughs> there goes the award. Anyway, um, and uh, Robert Hewitt Wolf sort of said I was the only person that literally did it in three takes, three different times. So he was like, that's why you got the part. It was easy for me because I like acting opposite myself because I know what I'm doing. I know what the other me is doing. No one else does, but... <laughs> well, you don't have to be in the same thing. <laughs> We're so mature. Um, but it was fun. Like, it, was, it was especially fun finding the kind of... Um, the different characterizations, because it wasn't something that, when I went into it, I knew exactly what I wanted to do 
with her in that regard. It was something that I sort of discovered along the way. And some of it was actually part of the, um, just the process of filming it because we had to shoot um, the green screen stuff. So that would be the AI stuff on the screen and the hologram stuff was shot on a different day than the Rami stuff, the actual physical body. So that became something that sort of informed the characterization of the different sort of facets of her, which was quite, an interesting discovery for me, but it was a lot of fun. I kind of liked it. I don't know if I could do it today though. My brain is just not that good, as evidenced by what you've seen here today. I'm not gonna comment on that. There's a lawyer in the room. Smart man. Yes. Hello. Um, this is for Michael. And um, I just wanna say, I think your best episode was Lifeboat. And my question is related to that. How hard was it to change between like 10 different characters while also still trying to be Daniel? Um, I had learned a valuable lesson. I had done a, a, a movie uh, when I left the show called All Around the Town, which uh, involved my character playing a, a psychiatrist opposite a, a gal who had multiple personality disorders, strangely enough. And I remember she had gotten cast two days before she actually after she auditioned for the role, she'd gotten cast two days before we started filming, which was a really not fair to her because she, you know, you go from an audition where you're just reading off whatever sides they give you to now playing this part where you might be playing seven different characters. And despite what some people think, that actors don't just have those things prepared in some amazing closet in the back of their brain, they actually have to do some work to create those, to bring those characters to life. So when I'd given, been given a hint that Lifeboat involved those kind of elements, I immediately got to go do some homework to try and evolve some characters, some personalities, at least some types um, that I could draw from to play this multiple, because that was the one thing is that when failing to play, when, when, when failing to be, have enough time to flesh out a character from your multiple personality disorder, because they're, they're all three-dimensional characters occupying the same space, you go to caricature, which is the bad guy. I'm, or the, this, you know, with her, in her specific case, it's like, I'm the femme fatale, so I'm going to talk like this. And then, you know, the bad one who's going to kind of talk like this. And you know, it, it becomes this general wash of stereotypes. And so I, I got a little bit more time, which is the key element to start doing the prep work. And I'd seen the girl struggle with this, you know, difficulty, the scenario that she'd been thrust into. It was really unfair to her. And I went, okay, if I ever have that opportunity to do that, I got to do the homework because it's, it's important to, to flesh that out. So, um, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, it was. Uh, it wasn't. Once I had done the homework, it wasn't as difficult as it could have been. So um, uh, it was a lot of fun to be able to to play that. You know that range of people inside my brain too. So it was. A, it was a gift from the writers as well. Thank you. Yes. Hey, uh, Michael. This is a question for you. So when you started playing Daniel, he was sort of a more quiet, reserved guy. Didn't really know how to use, for practical reasons, weaponry. But then later on. Uh, say start of season seven, you started to use more weapons. You started to do really cool things. He, uh, your character destroyed the Ori. He killed a lot of Gould, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At what point did Brad or Martin tell you that Daniel is a badass? Um, uh, it was actually in around season seven because at the very beginning of the show, uh, when we started, you know, doing the pilot, they tried to give. Uh, the props guys were trying to hand me this MP5, like in, our, in, the, in, the, in the pilot, in the off-world mission, they wanted to give Daniel an MP5, and I was like, what are you doing? Like, uh, and they're like, well, the producers want you to carry this weapon. I said, at, at what point in time, you know, unless he learned this when he was away on the planet, which wasn't clear in the script or wasn't clarified at all, I said, at what point did he, would he take this weapon up? Because he was kind of a pacifist in the, in the, in the movie. And so I kind of rejected that idea that Daniel would use a gun. He was the guy who was going to try and you know, use a peaceful process or negotiation or something. He wasn't going to be the, the gun-toting action guy. But it was when I came back to the show in season seven that Rob actually said to me, he said, but we need Daniel to be more a part of the action. So you got to sort of, you know, take that on. And so that was when I said, oh, okay, well, that seems like an evolution to take, especially if he comes back going, you know what? I got to do more while I'm here. So if I have to take up action, I have to take up action. So that's where we sort of started adopting Daniel as more a part of the action world than... The, in, the, in the previous five seasons that I'd been on the show. So that was kind of the transition, and I was um, Rob's uh, 
urging for, for me to sort of uh, be on, on board with. So that's when it sort of started. Oh, hey, oh, sorry, light. From our fans online. So this is Hi from- Hi fans online. Hi fans online. This is from Ian, Geek for Hire. He wants to know what do you both think you would be doing now in character, specifically for Daniel, given that earlier it was decided that Sam is running the SGC, and then Lexa, would you be running potentially something beyond the SGC, potentially? I feel like if Lamb was still there, she'd s still be like running the sort of medical side of things, either that or she's off world running another medical facility off-world on another planet with more new and more interesting alien diseases and medicine and stuff and body parts. <laughs> alien. It's getting dark in here. I have my pillow. I'm happy. <laughs> uh, Daniel would probably be locked in the trunk of Vala's car. This is true. This is true. Um, <laughs> sparing that, um, I think uh, my assumption was always that it seemed a natural evolution for him to, if, if, if it still existed at this particular point, he would have gone to Atlantis and carried on his um, ancient research. That seemed like a natural evolution, and wherever that evolved to, Daniel was always the one sort of seeking the answers, and he was just connecting the dots. Atlantis seemed like the natural place for him to gravitate towards, and wherever that research led him to would be next. So I think he'd be still out there looking. So um, that's always been my take on it. He's still going through the Stargate somewhere, so it uh, seemed to make sense. Uh, I see a big two over there. She's got five minutes. I know, but there's a two. Over oh, there. even there's a two. What's well, okay. like? It's like Sesame Street. <laughs> I see two. I see the number two. That's my count, and um, I didn't do it well. It was Actually, piggybacking on uh, what Michael was just saying, the first episode of SG One I ever saw was Prometheus Unbound, and I absolutely love the chemistry between you and Claudia Black. And I was just uh, wondering what it was like um, to work with her. I, obviously, it was a hoot to work with Claudia because um, uh, it, it, it was only meant to be this one episode, which was kind of what we call a second unit episode, and it evolved into a major part of season nine and season ten. So uh, I think that we had a lot of fun working together, and that kind of read on screen as well, and everybody seemed to, within the producers' ranks in the studio and the, and the network seemed to notice and, and wanted to see more of it, so that's what ended up happening. It was a lot of fun. She's a hoot. She's a... Uh, Brings a lot to the table in terms of both energy and ideas, uh, and sort of and straight up talent. And yeah, and talent, and she just reinvigorated um, my love for for doing what I was doing, and and uh, gave a whole different dynamic to, uh, to to Daniel. Some that people you know cared for, and some that people didn't. But I think that uh, it was a lot of fun on a daily basis to explore that different angle. So is that the one with my favorite line? I'm Hans Olo. Yeah, Hans Olo. Hans yeah. Olo. Yes. That one made me very happy. <laughs> Olo, a Star Wars, what is it, Star Wars story. I, I have a question for Val. What's your favorite episode? That, that's a tough one. Um, I'm gonna say, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that like it too, window of opportunity. <laughs> Woohoo! And thank you very good much. Good choice. Yeah, good choice. Oh, over here. Yes. Hi. So, um, for those who haven't been here for the last two days, I, I have an impairment in my mouth. I have a snake in my neck, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael, my question is for you. I discovered Stargate last year only, so I'm a newie, newbie. And one of my favorite characters in um, Stargate is the Unas. And one of my favorite face of you, like profile um, in that TV series, is uh, the, the linguist uh, Daniel and the humanist Lingual. So I was wondering if you could share some memories about filming some of those scenes with the Unas, like around the fire and that um, granola bar or whatever, uh, energy bar that they had to share with the Unas. Was it fun or not? 
Um, it was it was uh, I playing playing the Unas in the episode was uh, is an actor named uh, Dion Johnstone who I'd worked with um, in, at the end of season two. I did a production of Hamlet and he played he was my um, Horatio. Uh, so we'd already been working together and had a really good rapport from from doing Hamlet. And so when he was he'd already been on the show and a couple other. Um, uh, one other role at least uh, before he did the play the Unas role, and um, uh, he's a tremendous actor as well. Uh, so to have the level of expression and commitment that he had underneath all that prosthetic makeup was um, was a tough job, and he did it admirably and, and made it very easy to work off him in 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 you know uh, such a uh, confined kind of way. Um, and it was Peter DeLuise's story, and he was directing it. So um, you know, we were allowed to throw in a little, bit, little bits and bobs here and there to um, just to like like improv a little bit and, and whatnot. And and um, with Daniel as the the linguist trying to figure out Chaka was kind of one of those episodes where he's kind of in his element as well as you know trying to survive in the situation as well as all that. But I think a lot of it was to do with um, with Dion and how well he played that character. And I think when you know, no offense to. Um, to Mr. Curry when, when we did um, uh, Enemy Mine, which is the last episode that the Eunice appeared in. It wasn't quite the same without Dion there because he had become that character to, a, to myself and to a lot of people that it wasn't quite the same, doing the same kind of story with somebody else. Um, uh, just a, a rare gift to have working with a, a good friend and who's doing a fantastic job. And Dion continues to have a wonderful career. Oh, I think we've got one last question over down here. Hi, uh, the question is for both of you. Uh, it's about saving hope. Michael, you've been directing uh, Lexa. How is, was the, how is it for you directing your wife? And Lexa, how it was for you to be directed with Michael? Do you want to go first? You might as well just say it. Go ahead, just say it. Just say it. I love working with Michael as a director. He's actually, <laughs> we've had this, keeping it. Like, on your, keeping you on your toes, dude. Anyway, um, no, we've had this conversation before. I really like working yeah, with... I didn't expect you to, like, be honest and shit. I was just waiting for, like, the... <laughs> get a chance to stick it to me, and you just, like, sort of backed right off. I know, off. but I can't when it comes with, when talking to you about talking about your directing, because you're really good at it, boo. Like, he is. He is really... I've said this before about... I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Come on. I've said this before. I just wait. I'll smack you again. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Um, anyway, uh, no, I've said this before about about working with Michael as a director. Is that as like I, I've been doing this for 27 years. Legitimately, if he wasn't my husband, I would I would have really enjoyed working with him as a director in the sense that um, I trust him completely. He's got an amazing sense of story, and his sensibilities are are spot on. So and they're they're very similar to mine. So um, when it, and he gives great notes as a director probably because he's an actor um, I was, and understands how actors think, but also um, because he, he has such a great sense of um, story and his ability to break down a script and answer any question you could possibly have because he's already thought of, of all the, the, the problems or the challenges that are inherent in the script. So I really enjoy working with Michael. It's like the only time in her life that I'm totally comfortable with him telling me what to do. How did you feel hiring me, dear? Can I Makes, say that really builds up your ego, doesn't it? Yeah. I spend the next week after GateCon just crying in the corner. Yeah. Way to go, guys. Way to go. Um, I really enjoyed... Uh, well, I, obviously, I... I Suggested Lexa's hiring. Um, she was actually in Vancouver at the time when I was in Toronto. And when this, when I read the script, I was like, "Oh, well, this has got to be her, because I can trust her to be strong enough to match the other actor, which is what I needed. I didn't want anybody that was going to sort of like be just a guest star and just here to like you know please the other actor and make sure that they you know was doing what they want. I wanted somebody that was going to stand up to him and 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 be as assertive and strong as I needed to be. And I knew that that was going to be her, and that was, that's a natural part of her personality. She doesn't take much shit, so... Um, <laughs> trust me, I know. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, you know, I've worked, obviously worked, working with her before, I knew what kind of an actor she was, and, and she knows what kind of what my opinions are uh, a lot of the time are based in story, whether or not 
you know, this is a good idea for the story, or, you know, it's not based on anything other than whether this is the best idea for the story. So um, I think there's an inherent trust there, and, and I think the episode turned out really, really well. Out of all the ones that I directed, I think it's probably my favorite. So, um, yeah, I think it was an enjoyable experience, and uh, we'll do it again. Oh, yes, Val has something to say. Sorry, sorry. I just, I just wanted to say a big thank you. Obviously, I'll have to find Paul and give him a huge hug later. Uh, but I just want to say thank you for letting me sit next to you. You guys are both super amazing. And thank you for making the time to come to GayCon. I'm just coming slowly to the realization that I'm now being live streamed for like the past half hour. Uh, but, you know, there's worse things that have happened in life. So. <laughs> I just want to say thank you very much, and it was great uh, actually having the opportunity to be on stage with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Big round of applause for Val, everybody. And are we getting kicked We're off We're getting now? the hook. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Michael and Lexa. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you so much.